Welcome to School Talk. I'm Nadja Varney, your host. If teachers are mandated to teach to a core curriculum, and if our students have to pass tests based on that core curriculum, and if teachers and schools are evaluated based on those scores, then it's pretty obvious the most important thing is what happens in the classroom. Today we're talking about project-based learning. It's an education strategy that seems to me like a backlash to those who say we're teaching to the test and we're narrowing curriculum. My guests are Dr. William Okers. He's a researcher and author and a former award-winning teacher, a professor at Rhode Island College. And he was a consultant to schools in Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and elsewhere, I'm sure. He's currently an adjunct professor at Providence College. And with him is Ms. Cindy DiDonato. She's a curriculum technology integration specialist. Formerly, she was a high school English teacher, and she also is currently an adjunct professor at Providence College. Welcome, Bill, Cindy. <laughs> it's good to be, to be back, Naja. Yes, you are back. Yes. In fact, Dr. Okers, I was looking back um, to the days when you were teaching me. I was a reading specialist mm -hmm. in Attleboro, and we used to have you come in as a consultant, and that was quite a while ago. Yes, it was. And you were both on the show before. Mm -hmm. We were, yes. and it was a pleasure to well, talk thank to you, you uh, Nadja, at that time. Thank you for coming back. I didn't drive you away. <laughs> no, you certainly didn't. <laughs> well, in so many education magazines right now, mm. periodicals, even videos, they're talking about alternatives to what's happening in the classroom. And one of the things I was surprised to learn, more and more people, sometimes with a different title, mm. but they're talking about project-based learning. Mm. And my first question is, you're both educators for many years, and I'm wondering what has led educators now to research, and many are adopting uh, a project-based learning. Well, the world obviously has changed uh, in recent years, and it's moving faster and faster as we go. And when Tom Friedman wrote his book, The World is Flat, yes, I read that. Uh, he talked about we're in the information age now. We've passed the agricultural age, the industrial age, and it's information. Well, that was a few years ago. Uh, we believe that we've really moved one step beyond that. We're really in the problem-solving age, where you can always Google for information. Information is a commodity. It's mm -hmm. out there everywhere. We don't need to go to schools for information, but we do need to help students solve problems using some of that information. That's part one. The second reason I think we're moving to project-based learning is something I found out when I visited a local school superintendent a few weeks ago. And they are building a new middle school in this state. And what they do in order to determine what the program of instruction should be like, they gather citizens, um, teachers, people in the community, as well as students. And they say, what do you want? What kind of school do you want? And he said to me something I thought was rather remarkable. He said, the students said, we want to be engaged. We don't want to sit there, take notes, <laughs> take a test, and then forget it the next day. We want a different kind of education. And out of that came the notion that project-based learning really meets that need quite well. Mm -hmm. Well, I can hear that your philosophy may not be exactly in line with what's happening today and what's been happening in the past. And actually, there are other people talking about this. I, I read um, Susan Engel. She's a lecturer and William, a professor in psychology um, in Williams, at Williams College. She has videos out and so forth talking about what's happened to curiosity. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to read the whole thing here, but in one of her books, a best-selling, well, I'm just going to read a little bit from what she had to say. We seem to have drawn a line that leads from nursery school along a purely economic route with money as the final stop. And of course, she goes on to decry that. So you're talking now about engagement, what this uh -huh. superintendent said to you, and real learning. So how would you define for me now broadly what is project-based learning um, and the philosophy that's guiding it? Well, it starts with a problem, a real-world problem, and it ends with a real-world application. Mm. And let me give you an example. Uh, one of our students currently is studying with her, her classroom, about fourth graders, the Southwest states. Now, this is part of the traditional geography curriculum where they go around the country. They start with New England. They, they wind up in the Southwest. 
And according to the usual procedures that's being done, uh, students will learn some facts about the South at West States, some of the things that have grown there, uh, and then they'll write a little report. It sounds uh, typical. And they may do a diorama, which is another typical project, but not project-based learning. <laughs> but we, in project-based learning, we, we move one step further and say, what is a problem that's addressing uh, the Southwest states in the current day. And well, one obvious thing is the drought. They don't have water. So now we up the ante by saying it's not just learning the facts about the Southwest states, it's about solving the water problem. Well, there, a number of issues can come up, problems. One is how do we conserve the water? And more importantly for those states, uh, how do we distribute the water that's available? Who gets it? Who gets it? Is it the rancher? Is it the person who has a swimming pool? Uh, that becomes a contentious issue. And so now we move from the traditional study of uh, the state as a series of facts to solving the problem, addressing that issue. And so project-based learning ends then with saying, OK, we've got to really work on getting an answer to this problem because it's serious. It's, uh, we think of the, th we, we like to think recently, and Cindy and I have been talking about this, the three I's. Okay. Number one, I's, we problematize <laughs> the topic. Problematize. Mm. Uh, that's not original, but uh, <laughs> it's certainly appropriate. Yes. Number two, we contemporize the project. Even if you're studying ancient uh, history, we try to do something in the project to bring it up to date. Mm -hmm. And three, we localize it. We say it's not just about something out there, far away. It relates to your local community. We make, try to make the tie-in so they see the connections, and that's where you get engagement coming along. Well, that sounds quite interesting, A lot, maybe a lot of work. Um, and this sounds very different because we hear misconceptions <laughs> of, about project-based learning that this is not, <coughs> from what you've just said, doing a little project or an, enri an enrichment in the classroom. This sounds very, very different from that kind of experience. Um, now, research behind this is what I'm wondering about, because that can be either very helpful or people use research to manipulate what they want to happen. Yeah. I remember the old phonics versus look say and all these specious arguments mm -hmm. that just take up so much time in research. So I'm wondering if you could um, talk to me, is there current and solid research on any of this project-based learning? Cindy? Yes, there is. Um, mm -hmm. uh, all one has to do is to go to the Buck Institute website uh, and click on research. And there are 17 articles about uh, research that's been going on from, you said, Bill, Two thousand. 2000? 2000 to two, 2010. And there's another one coming up, in, or another review in 2011 <laughs> since then. So this is current. Oh, yes. yes. Oh, yes. And, and also, if you uh, were to Google um, the U.S. World Education uh, website, you would see a discussion there and some graphs about New Tech High, which is a series of schools around the country, one of which is in California. Mm -hmm. And um, they demonstrate that the schools there have students who are very successful when it comes to proficiency in language, wow. math, and college readiness. In fact, language, they point out, they have 100% proficiency. Uh, math, similarly, and they're uh, in the 98th percentile for college readiness. So this is a school that devotes itself totally to project-based learning um, with every subject that they work with. And they work in a cross-curricular fashion as well. How, how do you spell the first um site that you mentioned. Was the Buck it? Institute, that's, Buck. well, if you were to go to it, it's easier if you take B-I-E, which is Buck Institute Education. Oh, B-I-E would right. be the place to dot go. Right, dot org. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some people, you know, listening might like to look that oh, up. Yes. I would. And oh, when yes. you said Buck, I didn't know if it's yeah. B-U-C-H yeah. or C-K. Yes, so and, and certainly there's not only research mm -hmm. there, but lots of content area examples of successful project-based learning. Mm -hmm. Uh, units. This is important, I think, because you know anyone can come up with a fly-by-night uh, mm. idea, but this is being researched. Obviously, actually, you led into my next question because um, people are having to be tested based on the Common Core, mm. and I'm pretty sure there are people using project-based learning in schools mm. that are still under the Common Core and still being tested. Mm -hmm. So, um, will the students? in your classrooms where you are using project-based learning, 
are they going to be able to pass these tests that are connected to that Common Core curriculum? Will they be able? Now you spoke of a school, but this is that was a whole school that has, you know, hmm. actually embraced the whole idea. I'm talking about the experimental classrooms that you you know hmm. of. Do these children have a chance to pass these tests? Well, if you look at the Common Core, one word that comes up repeatedly is the word evidence. Students are expected in the Common Core to support their thinking. They can't just say, well, we just think that way. Where does it say that? Uh, where is the evidence for your assertions? Ah. Uh, that's big in the Common Core. That word repeats itself over and over. And you look at project-based learning and we say, well, that's what we do in project-based learning. We have a question that the students need to answer. And in order to answer it, they need to point to the evidence because these questions are messy, authentic, uh, ambiguous in nature. There isn't one single right answer. So where's your evidence? So there's a consistency between what the Common Core is asking for and what PBL is delivering. Uh, that's an important relationship that we, we see. So we like to say that Common Core is the what. It tells us what you should learn. <coughs> but PBL is the how. Exactly. We can accomplish it through other ways than the traditional instruction. And by traditional instruction, it really has become more traditional. We were talking earlier offset about how things were scripted and teachers are being, you know, hemmed in to just follow scripted um, material. So when you say this is something to free us from the traditional way, I'm glad to hear it because we're in the information age. <laughs> it's yes. time to break away from lecture. Mm. Yes. With regard to the Common Core and standards again, the mm -hmm. wonderful thing about project-based learning is that one can easily backward design the project so that you keep the common core standards in mind, state standards, whatever are the important standards that teachers need to meet, and make sure that the project deals with those and encourages the learning of certain skills that might be on state testing. And the most wonderful part of all is that students retain, we find that students retain information and skills much more under this uh, particular educational approach. It sounds that that to me, like that would be a natural outcome. If I go looking for information, like preparing for this show, hopefully <laughs> I will remember some of it. And if a student is digging, as you say, to find the answers to questions, mm -hmm. it would make sense to me that there would be better retention. Mm -hmm. if, you, if someone mm -hmm. just stood up and talked to me in a lecture, there's mm -hmm. you know, little chance of retaining more than maybe 10%. I think they've even done research on that. Mm -hmm. Yes. So that's why we keep this show uh, short, because we know America's attention spam. <laughs> We're really being good educators. It sounds to me like y your um, project-based learning is more, um, it's kind of an antidote to what we've been doing. We've been doing, I think, like one, one we go one inch, but lots of miles. Is that how they speak yeah. of it? Yes. And now that you're trying to do deeper learning. Absolutely. And that, that yes. produces more what you, the word you, I've heard you use a number of times, mm -hmm. authentic, mm -hmm. authentic learning, real yes. learning. Well, we have to go to a break, but when we come back, I'd like to hear how you actually go about this. Let's make it very pragmatic <laughs> and very realistic. You're in a classroom, mm -hmm. and we'll find out how you do this. We'll be right back. This you've got to see. They said I couldn't dream called me a piece of trash and swore that's all I'd ever be. Said a bottle couldn't see the ocean. Give up. Go back to the dumpster. But I didn't listen. I made my way. And now, I am what I've always wanted to be. My dear friends who are working so hard for project-based learning, I'm really putting you on the spot now. 
I'd like to know what really happens in a classroom. You said you engage the students. How do you do that to start? Well, let me tell you about a particular teacher that we had the pleasure of working with who was working with a third grade class. And they were working on uh, studying states. And um, they decided, after a bit talking about the states, that perhaps uh, these states have state insects. And what were they? And uh, I don't get a number of the school, uh, a number of the states they looked at talked about the honeybee as the state insect. And so they thought, well, gee, do we have a state insect? Now, these are third graders. They were curious about this. And they found out that this state does not have <laughs> oh. an insect. So that began the odyssey uh, of finding a driving question to make this project um, come alive. No, you, you're actually, I'm hearing you say that the topic actually came basically from the students. That's but my, that's in, my in understanding and discussing it with the teacher. But in the same, in the topic that was required. Mm. Right. It was but a the specific topic came from the student. From the students and their interest. Curiosity. And they, were, they were very curious about that. And the, uh, it progressed again to a driving question. Uh, and Bill, I mm. think, was yeah. instrumental in helping to cull that question. Yeah, we, we, did, we after talking to the teacher, we determined that this could have been an, a traditional uh, lesson when you learn about an insect and you write a report about the insect. And no, that's fine. But we wanted to up the ante and make it more project-based and with the driving question. So we said, you just found out that your state doesn't have an, an official insect. Suppose you actually tried to get your state to adopt the insect that you've selected as the state insect. Wow. <laughs> now, now, what's great about this question is that there's a risk involved. And one educator years ago said, all things being equal, a project is better if there's a risk, not to bodily harm, but a risk you may not make it. It may not work. Well, what they did in, in subsequent days, they, they got some help, outside help, and they had a bill introduced into the state legislature. You're kidding. Adopt this, <laughs> and it was written up in two local newspapers, one metropolitan paper, one local, about these students want their state to adopt this insect as their own. The bill's been introduced. It hasn't been acted on yet. It's still early in the session. But again, the excitement of these kids saying, somebody's paying attention to us. Our bill is up there with all the rest uh, of those, and uh, we need to promote it. We need to write letters. Uh, Cindy, you want to talk about some of the things sure. they had to do to, sure. to make it possible? Yes, uh, you know, the assessment was important in this project, as there also is importance of assessment everywhere in education, but it's, it's more authentic assessment in the sense that the students wrote letters uh, to the editor, they wrote letters to the uh, head of the General Assembly, and they um, were then able to have a wonderful, real experience. So often students are asked to write, but now they're writing for an important reason. Uh, they did get their letters published in three newspapers in the state. And as Bill mentioned, the, uh, they have a number to their bill wow. in the General Assembly. So it's a matter of time. At this point, it hasn't been acted upon. Um, they used uh, technology in order to um, move through this project. They used iPads. They did research. Uh, they were involved in the filming of videos. They, they honed their presentation skills because they had invited for an interview um, Lou Parati, who was in charge of, of this whole uh, insect that they decided to adopt, which is the American burying beetle. Oh, my. And it's endangered. Yes. And so this gentleman came into the classroom, and they were able to interview him and to present their idea to him. This is amazing because I can see all the latent learning. Mm. You're not saying, we're teaching composition writing today. Take out your books. They're writing with a purpose mm -hmm. and ready to edit because they want yes. it to look oh, yes, good absolutely. rather than just the teacher put a red That's mark right. on it. That's right. I could say, and the research, I mean, all these students by third grade know about Google. Mm. So they've learned how to look for things and 
find something that's substantial. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. It's now, amazing. I, I and they were able to collaborate. They loved. Together. That was one of the favorite things that they mentioned was <coughs> that they could collaborate. Work also, together. Work together and also, as Bill said, to have a voice mm. and be heard yes. by adults. Well, I mean, that's, that's cream on the cake. Yes. Because yes. just all the learning that went on and then to have it go out into the real world in a, in a mm -hmm. significant way, that's pretty amazing. Now, this sounds great, but what's the teacher's role? Do you need a teacher in there? <laughs> Of course. What, of course. <laughs> the, the teacher is going to facilitate this. Sometimes, as in the case of the third grade, I'm sure that teacher would be involved in helping to create or guide the driving question once she sees the student's engagement in the topic. Mm -hmm. And of course, then the teacher would need to provide ways in which the students would do research. Mm -hmm. And certainly with younger students, a teacher might want to choose sites that are appropriate, age appropriate for mm -hmm. the student. And of course, be involved with inviting experts in mm -hmm, mm -hmm. should that happen so that kind of uh, guiding and facilitation and again it's a certain amount of work it's not just planning oh. a lesson from a textbook but I, we find that teachers who engage in this become just as engaged as their students mm. I, I just I so agree with that what you just said because when I was in the classroom which was not most of the time I was a reading specialist mm. but the children had so much to add if we would listen to them, yes. right. even first graders, their background of experience and their own understandings. And by the way, do you still use books along with te technology? Of course. <laughs> of course. I'm kind of joking, <laughs> but they do. Uh, students are reading mm. from books, from screen, and writing. Um, do they write on screen too, or just. Well, um, they, this particular class was using an e book. E which is part of, it's an app that can be downloaded for, uh, on the iPad and they were able to uh, create their presentation through there oh. and either, if I'm sure if they wanted to write a story they might be able to do that as well using mm -hmm. that software. It sounds very exciting and it sounds as though they're not just all stuck in their seats uh, like the little boy I was talking with mm. about after, before we went on the air mm. who he just could not sit. He would be breaking pencils or scribbling mm. or whatever. This provides, as you said, collaboration. Mm. Could you describe a room, what might be going on? With, they're not all sitting there listening to the teacher lecture. How would it look? Well, I think you'd see, first of all, the students are sitting perhaps in groups of four, sitting around, and they've been giving an assignment, uh, which is a part of, let's say, in the insect situation, to, to look at uh, perhaps insects from other states or mm -hmm. to, to research the insect. Uh, as a team, because collaboration is very important, they learn how to work as a team. They learn what the rules of engagement there are. And they have a chance to, to divide the work up, to decide who's going to do what. We call it voice and choice. Voice and choice. Let me think about that. What does that mean? Uh, the students have a voice in what happens. It, it isn't a matter of saying, uh, listen to the teacher, the teacher wants you to do this. Mm -hmm. The students can choose their roles in, their, in the collaborative effort. Uh, and then they choose how to work out those roles in, in dealing with the particular project they're on. Uh, and then, of course, after they've made the decisions together and divided up the work, they come back and they, they present something to another important piece of project-based learning, the public audience, which we alluded to. It's not just the teacher and the other students who hear them. We invite ordinarily guests from the outside, mm -hmm. particularly in the inside case, it might be a person that knows a lot about insects or is interested in insects who can come in and critique their presentations. It, it does a couple things for the students. It heightens the level of motivation. This must really be important. We're inviting mm -hmm. outside people to hear you. And two, you're going to get feedback from a person that's very knowledgeable. And that's mm -hmm. a lot different than the teacher who may know something about the insects, but the, the guest mm -hmm. knows a lot. Uh, that whole, adds a whole lot to this work of collaboration. Mm -hmm. I, can, I can picture that even from the first graders where somewhat, someone who couldn't read as well but was a marvelous artist mm. could fit right in to a group collaboration mm -hmm. um, we're coming to the end but yes yeah, I just you wanted want to, to say that, that yeah. teachers also provide many lessons it doesn't mean oh. that lecture is dead oh, with project-based mm -hmm. learning there are times mm. where teachers mm -hmm. have to scaffold uh, the lesson and to prepare students for what they may have to do 
So that's certainly mm -hmm. there as well. I'm glad you added that because um, that we sometimes forget that we just don't hand out stuff and say go to work. Mm, that's right. The, the person who's behind all of this, managing mm. the information, the, the classroom management, time, materials. I mean, this is the magic of being a teacher. It's science and art, isn't exactly. it? It doesn't exactly. happen exactly. by just getting a book and reading the script. No, no. Um, we're coming near the end, and I wondered if you could summarize some of the skills basic skills for this new century that we're in. Um, you know, we have the technology and we're in the 21st century of information. Mm -hmm. um, some people call the skills that PB, uh, PBL, I'm calling it, Project Based Learning, they call them soft skills. I don't see them as that, but mm -hmm. how would you summarize the skills that these students are gaining? Well, we talk about the four C's uh, often. Collaboration, we've already mentioned as one of those. Mm -hmm. Critical thinking, when they have to examine evidence from various sources. Communication, in which they have to share that information to other, other people. Creativity, in which they become right. innovators, and they have to think outside the box and not just repeat what past, uh, what past history has told them. Mm -hmm. uh, those are the big four. I would also add curiosity. Mm -hmm. Because if you get a, a youngster who's curious, that person then will go on far beyond whatever the class assignment is, and they'll go out, venture out on their own, and, and that's important too. Yes, and, and, just, and okay. they also, those four C's or five C's as Bill mentioned, all aim toward problem solving, ah. which is much needed in our world today. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. Um, this has been so enlightening, and I'm going to come back and ask you to rewrite the I's, the three I's, the four C's, and that's a wonderful way to kind of remember things. So I will be back um, probably via email to find that out. Thank you so much for joining me. You're thank very you. welcome, Nadja. It's been a pleasure being on your program again. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. In closing, when I think about project-based learning, I'm reminded of a phrase that was used by one of our country's most noted education reformers, the late Dr. Ted Sizer. He used to answer a question which was put to him often, what's the purpose of education? And I think his answer is implicit in project-based learning. He said, the main purpose of education is to learn to use your mind well. Insightful, and what I hope we inspire here on school talk.